if you just keep doing this and you stay diligent, the success train is coming. Um, the success train has pee on the floor mm. and graffiti. <laughs> Drawn on the train car. As much as we like to think that all it takes is determination, it takes formal business training too. I'm not business trained. I didn't attend any formal classroom instruction, a seminar or something. I had, I want to own a studio. I know how much the rent costs. I know how many people I need to hire. I knew those things. The other shit, the legal stuff, the insurance, all like so much in order to get some sort of crack in the door here. You got to know the game and have a go. I did not know the full ins and outs. In hindsight, I had to hold myself accountable and say, baby, you wrote a check your ass could not cash. Welcome back to the Three House Show just listen to a very short snippet of Alchemist, okay? The song is coming out. I know I do it every episode, but I promise you it's coming out. I'm not capping. Um, I don't know, but I feel like this is the trillest podcast in the universe. You feel me? Um, today, today, we have an extremely <laughs> special guest. So we met by chance about a year, about a year ago. A little over. A little now. over. This February Black everybody. History Month 2021. And she did my makeup. I never had makeup. Listen, as a guy, I'd never done makeup before. So I was like, I was like, what is this? But I'm always open to new experiment experiences. So I said, bet, let's get it. She, you know what I'm saying? But what I what really like made me remember it was the conversation we had and just the connection we had. And she was really vulnerable and authentic with me. And a lot of strangers aren't like that. So that really touched me. And I remembered that 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 made me think about oh how I could open up too. And you know, we don't always have to keep things in and just be so controlled all the time you know so that's that was my Im impulse um but just speaking on you know her magnificence we have somebody we have somebody just a creator you know she she labels herself as a digital creator as a body i love i love how you go from body image to body love advocate yes. you know and that's a huge difference distinction to make but you know not only a you know an expert 18 years in cosmetology <laughs> you feel me 18 years in esthetician listen i may not be saying it correctly but it's that it's esthetician i don't know listen you hyping me up i'm like who's in the room like, like, like you tell me you feel me like i'm honored i'm honored to just be in the presence you know someone who has a resume like long af you know worked with smino worked with vic Mensa, you know worked with you know Lollapalooza, pitchfork you know just has you know, been in those trailer trailers and been in behind the scenes, you know, getting people prepared to be on these, you know, these major blockbusters. And honestly, yeah, just is humble, is here today and is here with the story of encouragement, is here with the story of, you know, never compromising your integrity, is here with a story of um, just success, you know, from from hard work and belief in who you are. We have the one and only CJ Iman. Hi. The hello. fuck is up? Hi. Hello, 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 hello. First off, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure. This is really fucking dope. I love the fact that, you know, like I I was just chilling and then you just <laughs> were like, hey, remember me? Can we? Can we do this podcast situation? And I was just like, yeah, sure. Like, I'm now that my schedule's free, like, why not? So, thank you for thinking of me. Um, I'm really surprised that I had an impact on you a whole year and some change ago. Yes. But the fact that, you know, it's it was there, left an impression, um, it just lets me know that, you know, obviously I'm doing something right. <laughs> mm. So, thank you. Thank you very much for having me thank, on. Thank you for for acknowledging the fact that, you know, we have impact yes. on each other sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't even realize it. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. And, like, not to fucking hold any horses, like, we spoke off the record. Mm-hmm. 
We spoke off the record. Beautiful yeah, conversation. Because I was already done with, you know, getting you prepared. I was basically, I think I had about 20 artists to get through. Mm. And it, it, the numbers weren't exactly that because I know there were some, like, last minute changes th- that day. But there were a lot of artists that I had to get through. And so I think our conversation was kind of like in between people, mm. if I'm not mistaken. I think, I know I stepped out to get some fresh air because we were all masked up like yes. heavily at that time. 2020, 2021, yeah. Yes. And um, in fact, I was really surprised that I was reached out about that project because I thought that I was going to have to spend the first half of the year pretty much like not working. Mm. Um, So yeah, the whole thing was a very happenstance type of situation. (laughs) Mm. So it's just the power of, you know, just kind of watching the universe lay things out for you to set you up to go to the, you know, whatever the next thing in, in keeping in mind that things are full circle. Because imagine if I had treated you in a way that impacted you but in a negative way you would have been thinking about that for a year plus Mm. um so yeah i'm I'm just i'm sitting here kind of like wow it's kind of wild how you know just being your authentic self in whatever space you find yourself in whether it's your workspace your home space and your social settings like being your authentic self is definitely impactful in the most you know, powerful way. I can't say positive or negative because sometimes mm. being someone being their authentic self could mean that they are being <laughs> on the shittier side. <laughs> you might catch somebody on an off day. We've all had them. I'm sure that there's someone that's like, oh, you know, that's not the experience that I had of CJ mm. at some point in my life. So, I mean, I can't say that, you know, oh, be yourself. It's always going to be positive. No, but it will be impactful. Like, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Mm. Speaking of impactful, speaking of the conversation we had, just the vibe, and speaking of, you know, what you do, mm-hmm. makeup artist, esthetician, <laughs> um, cosmetics, cosmetologist, yeah. for 18 plus years, w- was this a skill that you developed over time, like sharpening the saw of like the therapy aspect, like communicating and like, you know, those interpersonal, or was this something that like you already was good at that, so that came naturally, or like, what was that process? So, um, as far as the skill part goes, it's just like anything else. You're not gonna be good off top. I was, I'm not gonna say horrible. (laughs) (laughs) It's worse. Because, you know, even with the skills being lack thereof, there were more people, you know, still reaching out to work with me in the very beginning stages. Most of the people were people who knew me personally and were my friends and were Mm. willing to allow me to touch drive some of those things on their faces. Thank goodness makeup is removable. Mm. Um, But as far as, you know, the interpersonal portion of things, that I can probably say has always been just in me um Mm. I've been one of those type of kids who like as I remember as a kid um my mom having to pull me aside and be like everybody's not your friend you know Mm. you gotta you gotta understand that having the My apologies, Tree. I was going to second floor. <laughs> you feel me? It's... Gotta love Chicago, right? So it's, it's, we, it's what made us. Deep in here, right? We ain't in no, we ain't in no fancy schmancy. Uh, she, you feel me? It's come, the latest studio. Come now before it gets to that point. You feel me? Come, come okay. all the symbol. You feel me? We on the grassroots side of you life. You feel right me? Uh, loyal to the soil. Period. Um, <clears throat> but no, I, I did always have that like ability to connect with people socially. And it was something that my parents, um, specifically my mom, because my dad, uh, he kind of let me do my own thing. Like as far as my personality goes, it was more of like, that's my little girl. If that's what she wants to do, that's how she's going to be fine. As long as, you know, I knew to respect my house and Mm -hmm. respect my parents, I could pretty much be free to, you know, speak my mind and things like that. But my mom specifically wanted me to be careful 
Um, I think because she saw a lot of herself in me. You know, mothers have a different connection with their daughters um, than fathers do, typically. Um, so I know that, you know, she was very adamant about being selective and being discerned. <laughs> she used to always say discern. I used to always be like, what the fuck was that even mean <laughs> in my mind? I'm like, discern, whatever. I'm just... I just want to go to this party. You know what I mean? Like, that was my mentality. But looking back at it now, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, my mom was actually preparing me because she, I think she knew that I was not going to ever be in a situation where I was going to be introverted or um, withdrawn from people. I think she kind of always saw, like, no, my kid's going to be the kid that's going to gravitate towards people. She's going to you know, not seek popularity, but more so it's going to just happen, you know? So, um, that part of being a makeup artist is what carried me through not knowing what the hell I was doing mm -hmm. <laughs> because there were plenty of times where I know for a fact, I look back at the photos and I'm just like, me now <laughs> would be like, what were you doing? You were not, you weren't paying, were you paying attention? Like, what is this? But because, you know, during the process of applying the makeup, I'm being my authentic self. Um, in the very beginning stages, I used to be very candid about the fact that I was inexperienced. I used to be very, very honest, you know, and say, hey, you know, this is only, you're only my fourth or fifth person that I've done professionally, you know. And I would differentiate between professionally and just for practice. <coughs> um, that's what got, got me through. So now that the skills have been sharpened, and I don't find myself uh, nervous that what I know is going to read well on someone else's face. Because that's a big, big deal when you're a makeup artist. You worry about that. Like, I know how to do it on my face, but is it going to look good on this person? You know, so now that those fears have kind of been ironed out just through the years of experience, it gave me the time to develop the personable side of things. So... I'm not an asshole <laughs> when I'm doing my job because I'm confident and I'm comfortable in what I've done. And I'm so, you know, I'm in such a good space with that, that I can actually take those reservations and those worries and put them more into getting to know my client and having that connection with them. So that way, you know, whatever happens, because here's the thing. I still, as a professional to this day, knowing that I know what I'm doing with my eyes closed, have had people that have not been 100% satisfied with my job. Not because of my lack thereof, but because what they were expecting versus what was executed mm -hmm. did not match in their mind. So the personable side of things is also to know how to take your L's as well. Mm -hmm. Um, especially when you're working as an artist, you feel me? Like, yes, I'm a makeup artist, but working in an arts driven, uh, career in general, whether you're in clothing, music, visual, even now the influencer realm, mm -hmm. you know, cause a lot of that stuff is creative, creativity based work. We tend to take the fact that we work so hard and we put so much time and we put so much effort and energy into our art um so personal that when the public receives it i.e us providing our services we are expecting them to love it as much as we do and when they don't we are not okay with that <laughs> but the problem with that is that you, Don't you can't grow. take that shit personal. You feel me? You just can't take it personally. Because if you do, you're never going to push yourself to continue. You know what I'm saying? Like, currently, um, in where, where I'm at right now with my whole, you know, artistry and everything, I'm at a crossroads. Um, to be 100% honest, I am teeter-tottering between walking away from my career of 18 years and segueing into something completely removed from makeup artistry um, or taking 
the experience that I've had for the past 18 years. Finding some kind of way to remix it, revamp it, restructure it, reformat it to where it still has the quality and the authenticity that I have worked so hard to, you know, build up or, you know, just kind of like continue what I'm doing now and not make any sort of like concrete decisions and just kind of like take a little piece of everything and just keep, you know, doing a little, little bit here and a little bit of there and a little bit everywhere. Um, and it's a very heavy decision. I haven't made up my mind yet. I'm just being honest about it because I don't want people to take the fact that I said, hey, I've been doing this for 18 years and think that that's the marker of success. It's not, you know? I did this for 18 years because I was trying to prove something to myself, but also this was where I could finally feel like I was fitting in. Even though technically that's not what was happening. Cause I, I'm learning now, you know, in this marker that like, I really don't fit in certain spaces that are designated for makeup artists and, you know, just in general, not in this city specifically, but I'm just saying overall, I don't fit the mold of what the typical quote unquote celebrity or like, you know, social media heavy makeup artist looks like. I know I don't. So um, I'm learning now like, okay, what what is that uniqueness gonna do for me? Like, where is that gonna take me? So to tie it back into what I was saying previously, why that's all important to think about is because as long as you're not being bombarded with the feelings of I have something that needs to be validated by outside people you'll be able to navigate through these very difficult things without feeling like other people have to give you your markers or your navigation you know what I know for myself whatever decision I make moving down the line with my career is going to be mine and it's going to be because it's what was best for me not because, you know, oh, X, Y, and Z people think that I'm the best or A, B, and C people think that I'm whack and I got to show them like, actually, no, I'm, I'm nice as fuck. Like, I don't care about those things any longer. And at a certain point as a creative, you do care. If you didn't care, you wouldn't continue to pump your art out. <laughs> it's kind of a, I don't know, it's like it fuels, it feeds the beast. You know what I'm saying? But then at a certain point in time, you don't want that beast to get out of control. So that's when it, it becomes, okay, am I doing this because this is what I love to do? Am I doing this because this is my my life's work, my purpose, my calling? Or am I doing this because I'm, I'm tired of, you know, the chirping in my ear that I've been getting surrounding the fact that I even made this decision to be a full-time artist? Um, so, yeah, it's... it's Huh, 18 years of doing this has been, yeah, <laughs> it's been quite a journey. It's been quite, quite the journey. But I'm grateful. I'm grateful though. Like, I'm not saying, I'm not shitting on my experiences or, and I'm not trying to downplay it or anything like that because in general, putting a decade into anything, let alone two, is a big deal. You know what I mean? But it's more so I I don't want to glorify something that honestly speaking in hindsight, you know, I wonder every now and again, what would have happened if I had decided to say, this is my last year doing makeup artistry. Now I'm going to tap into this other creative thing that I have and develop that. And then now I'm going to tap into the next thing and I'm going to develop that. You know what I mean? So doing that now after all this time has passed for me is kind of like you know starting all over again in in certain places and spaces where at one point in time I'm was starting to be you know looked at as like an expert in my field or you know a master of my craft yeah <laughs> I'm just processing all of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's no, like 
I, I vibe with that so heavy. Mm-hmm. You know, just the fact that the value of the opinion or point of view of somebody in your position, just yeah. that alone, <laughs> just wow. Because, you know, like 18 years, like, yeah. But, you know, like, to, to do the same thing for it, because, like, I'm Aries, you know. That fire um, energy. Let's do it. Let's do it. And it <laughs> Two well, fire weeks later, burns out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it burns a the ashes. huge thing for me. Yeah. A huge like milestone I had to overcome was okay. Yeah, you good at like jack of all trades. Oh, you do this. You do this. You do that. You good at that? Mm-hmm. But then like two years later. What it's you doing? Side. Where's the consistency? Yes. Where's the oh oh the growth? Because you, you in order to see growth, you have to keep doing it. Yeah. You know. So my my question to you is like what kept you, like for those eighteen years? What what was like the source of you keep coming back? Because you say you're passionate about dancing. You say you're yeah. passionate about these other things, right? Exactly. But it seems you gravitated towards. Cosmetology and all mm-hmm. that. You know, did you ever narrow down what the source of that was? Was it you like interacting with people? Was it the like what? What was your favorite part of cosmetology? So, um, in order to answer that question, I have to tell you the origin story yes. of how I got into what I do. Um, so, like you said, dance, my first love. Like that's. If you want to say, you know, the the comparison would be like, that was my high school sweetheart. You know what I'm saying? I grew up with dance. And it was past high school sweethearts because I actually started dancing when I was three. Um, I had been pretty much rejected from every dance school that my mother would try to put me in. Because my mom was the person that noticed that I was a dance kid. Um, she said that I was one of those babies that you put the song on and I'm bopping, you know, to the beat in the crib. So I've always been movement based. I've always had a love of dance. There's never been a time I can remember in which I did not have dance as far as my, in my upbringing. I can't remember a time where I didn't have dance in my life. So. They busy today. Right. (laughs) I'm like, it's only May 1st, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. Mother's Day around the corner. Yo, right. Somebody TT's out here (laughs) going in. (laughs) Um, So my mom, when she finally found a dance place, dance a studio that was inclusive and and welcoming of children who look like me. Um, And when I say look like me, I mean children who had nappy, 4C hair, um, brown skin. I'm not a darker skin person, uh, so I'll never go there and try to make it seem like I was... um, picked on and mocked about my skin in my community but in a non-black space yes I am considered a darker skinned person so there were places and spaces that would not accept me no matter how high my legs kicked no matter how well I could pick up choreography they just weren't having it and instead of my mother forcing me to fit into a space that didn't want me she found inclusivity for me so I grew up dancing in a place that was welcoming ish (laughs) inclusive ish because there were still nuanced uh things that happen within our communities on uh young black girls who develop faster who are fuller figured who are thicker bodied um and unfortunately i experienced that no slight against anyone not calling anybody out of course but it just that's what the experience was of a child who was born in the late, you know, mid eighties, growing up in the early nineties. So, um, I kept dancing because that was my love. You know what I'm saying? And that, that mentality of you do what you love and you keep doing it. That was just a natural thing that was put into me from my parents. Both my parents have their own hobbies, um, that have nothing to do with the other person doesn't mean that they love each other any less but they just do them and they put that in me so me dancing was really just me doing me you know what I mean and so when I got to an age where dance was now an option to get me to college get me through college get me work get me money and my mom you know was explaining all of this to me like people are looking at you to audition that's a whole different avenue of opinions and eyes on you than your inclusive dance school which yeah they might have jokes about your weight yeah they might you know make you feel a little uncomfortable every now and again with you know playing the dozens how kids do back in the day 
but that's not the same thing as a producer at a table looking at your picture, looking at you and telling you. Today is, is I, I've done this a lot of episodes and this has been a lot. Yeah. I, I'm just letting it know. Like, it's it doesn't good. happen this much. We downtown. It could. They all could be going to the same place though. They just lower. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. It could just be some one place that's just like really, really fucked up. Man, I wish him like, uh, healing and whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, I do hope it's nothing serious. Hopefully, it's just too many people wanting to be nosy, but we'll find out on the news later if it's a big deal. Right, man, I ain't gonna lie. I signed up. I don't watch the news. I don't watch the news myself, but my mother watches the news. And if it's on in the TV and I'm walking past, I'll be like, oh, damn. That's the generation. <laughs> My mom was a boomer, so they can't help it. <laughs> but no, so um, yeah, I I kept dancing, um, and it got to got me to the point where I was being considered for auditions, and my mom needed to be very candid with me and let me know like there's gonna be times where you know you are looking to um, get the kind of feedback that you're used to from your inclusive you know, somewhat inclusive dance space that you grew up in. It's not the same thing as a producer sitting at a table with a picture of you and picking you apart and saying, well, can you do something about your hair? Can you do something about your your boobs? Can you do something about your your weight or whatever? So um, knowing all of this and experiencing, you know, bits and pieces of what it did feel like to have that fat phobia projected on me, um, when I got to college, no one told me I was too fat for the dance team, but I got that vibe and that feeling of like, I probably don't belong here. Even though I auditioned, sent the tape, got accepted. They were like, yes, let's do it. Um, that was imposter syndrome. You know what I'm saying? Imposter syndrome that unfortunately was rooted from the fat phobia that was projected on me when I was, you know, a young shorty. Um, so with all of that, you know, background and context being understood, when I got to college, I mentally checked out of a lot of shit. I didn't want to go to class. I didn't want to go to practice. I didn't care about anything other than exploring my sexuality and exploring friendships and relationships on a level that was not under the eyes of people that were my elders because I was a very very um guarded child like guarded by other people you know what I mean like I I grew up in a neighborhood where people knew my folks and if I was outside doing stuff I didn't have any business doing the word would get back and it would be a wrap so I didn't even bother <laughs> so my shift in priorities just kind of led me away temporarily from dance and it was because I didn't understand what traumas I was you know processing at that time and at the time of course therapy is not even on the table to be discussed in our community uh so all that being said my dancing became very lackluster at that age you know I didn't warm up correctly I didn't audition for solo pieces I barely made it to practice on time. And so the consequences of that was being pulled aside by the director of the dance companies, um, you know, everybody that ran shit. And they let me know, like, we brought you into this program. We thought you were going to do well. You're not doing well. Um, we're going to have to have you sit out the rest of the season. And as a mercy on me <laughs> they were like okay go ahead and you know we'll find something for you to do production on the production side of things so that you can still participate and not lose the little bit of money that you're getting in the scholarship that we're giving you but like you're not dancing <laughs> so um I was stuck on costumes hair makeup backstage getting ready getting everybody cute and it was low it was low-key supposed to be a lesson <laughs> you know like look at all your friends getting ready to go out here and perform and tear it up and you know every single move that they know and you can't do it because you bullshitted your whole way through um and so that kind of thrusted me into being forced 
to see what it really looks like backstage getting ready in a collegiate, you know, like close to the professional level of performance. And seeing it was a hot mess. Everybody was doing their own makeup. Everybody was doing their own hair. <laughs> Costumes was, you know, passed down from other dancers. So some stuff fit, some stuff didn't. It was just crazy, chaotic, and just a mess. And it was very intimidating at one point. But then at a certain point, um, I actually preferred to help people get ready than I did um, with dancing. Because honestly speaking... When you are a fuller bodied dancer, you give a flying fuck. You give a big fuck about how you appear on stage because people are already marking you that or oh, her, you know, or they're, you know, because this big, big dancers get it no matter where your gender identifies. Um, but speaking in my experience, you feel me like I've heard the comments. My mom has told me about times where people have said hey there were people talking really mean about you know your daughter I, I i don't know how to tell you this but yeah i just want to apologize in case the word gets back because you know this is a dance recital other people who knew me were there you know so um the the mental you know preparedness to say okay well you know what if y'all i know y'all don't talk about my weight but y'all not about to talk about my hair y'all not about to talk about my makeup y'all not about to talk about my costume I'm finna be bad as hell. So I <clears throat> have always been mindful about how I appeared on stage. So that took it into the professional field and going into cosmetology because I've been practicing making sure, you know, my skin tone looked good with makeup and making sure that my hair looked like it was styled in a way that made sense to the costume and that the costume didn't have me spilling out all over the place um and of course if someone's smaller than you you can do that shit with your eyes closed i was the biggest person on the, on the team so there was no it was no brainer for someone who was a quarter of <laughs> you know a costume that i had to help fit you know her body into that or get someone whose hair has a relaxer and my hair wasn't relaxed in a sleek ponytail it was it was easy to help people adhere to these European standards of beauty because I was trying to get to that the best way that I could in a body that wasn't made that way. You know what I mean? So it wasn't something that I was like, initially, it wasn't something that I was like, oh my God, I love doing this. Oh my God, this is amazing. It started out as a punishment. And then it went from a punishment to like, y'all look crazy, let me help. And then it went from, y'all look crazy, let me help, to like, wait a minute, I know what I'm doing a little bit. Let me, let me tap into this. Let me see if this is actually like me knowing what I'm doing or if this is just like a fluke. Um, and then once I actually got a job, my very first cosmetology job, um, it was cosmetic, I'm sorry, not cosmetology, excuse me, cosmetic sales. Mm -hmm. That's when I knew. I was like, I could sell makeup to white people. I got this. I know what I'm doing. Like this. Okay. Move, you know? And so that was kind of the progression of it. It went from a non thought <laughs> to like a subconscious thought bubbling up to the surface. And then it went from that to like an actual calculated decision. Like this is what's going to be my thing. Y'all got y'all shit. This is going to be my shit. Um, and in hindsight, tying it back to what we were talking about in the beginning of our conversation with the 18 years, in hindsight, my makeup artistry career was masking the fact that I felt shunned out of the dancer world in general. Because, of course... The punishment in college was only for a couple of a couple of months. You feel me? Like when I got to the age of being a full grown adult, I'm no longer bound by collegiate activities. I can just go pay for a pickup class. I'm still not feeling included in those spaces because there's no dancers with bodies that look like me. There's no black dancers in these rooms. The dancers that might 
kind of sort of be someone I can potentially connect with have already been well established in that space and so it's a very you can't sit with us type of atmosphere in general um but where where I was needed regardless of my size regardless of my hair regardless of what my financial circumstances were regardless of everything what I was needed for was to help motherfuckers feel better when they were about to get on that stage and that carried a lot of blank like that blanketed a lot of shit that I had pretty much buried you know what I'm saying I've had which uh, it ties into me becoming a body love advocate it, it, it just all is crazy how like the layers and the intersections the of like the shit that connects exactly um I realized in that you know makeup artistry space because people don't realize this but a lot of makeup artists out here are people who are in those marginalized groups there are a, I can't even tell you how many fat makeup artists are out here. I can't tell you how many queer makeup artists are out here. How many makeup artists who don't fall under a gender binary. Like, just half the techniques that are viral right now on YouTube are s techniques that were started in the drag community. You know what I mean? So, a lot of us have used our cosmetology our makeup artistry are is are basically our eye to help individuals who don't look like us feel good about themselves we use that almost in a cathartic way you know and so a lot of the times what kept me going in those 18 years wasn't the fact that i'm a makeup artist and this is my art and this is my calling and this is my passion no it was I hate the way that the world makes me feel. I fucking hate it. I wake up sometimes and I wish I wasn't in this body. But you know what? I'm going to do the best that I can do with it. And how I'm going to do the best I can do with it is my hair is going to be laid. My face is going to be on point. My outfit is going to be the best that I can do with, you know, the resources that I had to look fly as fuck. And people are going to compliment me. If they do, they're going to compliment me on the fact that I put myself together. I'm polished. I'm out here in these streets. You know what I'm saying? And that's <clears throat> that's not the mentality that you should have when you do that, of course. It's a band-aid. It's a cast, actually. Mm -hmm. Because a cast is hard. It's, you can't, it's, if you do it correctly, it's, uh, it's, it's a temporary fix. Proof. Exactly. Exactly. But just like a cast, you got to be careful because if you are too rough, your cast could crack. If you're careless and you get your cast wet, it could dissolve and fall apart. It's still as just as strong as it is, is as delicate as it is. And anybody that's in this profession can tell you, you have to have a balance of both. You have to have a balance of the strong and the and delicate, the vulnerable. And that's where, you know, what you were saying as far as that part of me coming through, that's what that was. I've now gotten to a point because what I just described to you about what kept me going was more so in like the first half of my career. You know what I'm saying? Round about year 10, 11, when I realized like, yo, I've been doing this for 10 years. I got some shit I got to address about myself, you know, within myself. I have, you know, I have yet to celebrate any of the milestones. I've never celebrated any markers of my career. <laughs> I've not celebrated a, a decade anniversary, a 15 anniversary. I don't know if I'm going to do a 20 year. I don't know. You know what I mean? Because it's just one of those things I wake up and I'm like, oh, yeah, damn. Another year gone down the line. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> it's one of those things where, you know, you you have to just. You have to stop and say, okay, am I doing this? Like I say, am I doing this because this is <clears throat> my calling? Am I doing this because I'm passionate about it? Am I doing this because this is what I live, breathe, eat, sleep, think about 24-7? Or am I just really fucking good at this? I know how to make money off of it. And the compliments are feeding my ego. The success is feeding my ego. What I think is success. Because like I told you before, I'm at a crossroads and part of why I'm at a crossroads is because 
a marker of success that I thought I needed to validate my career was abruptly taken from me this year. Abruptly. Like, one minute I had a physical space to do all my work out of. Emo- I Emoja. Right? Yeah, Emoja mm-hmm. Studio. Um, I started the company in 2020. Uh, we moved into our first first physical space in that same year. And then we had to upgrade and move into a larger space for 2021. And then we were freaking, I mean, booked out the ass the whole entire year. I'm taking trips, you know, for work, not just taking trips because I'm kicking it. I'm actually like going out of town, conducting business from another state back to Illinois. I'm seeking new spaces because I was, we were already outgrowing the space that we were already in. But I just knew that financially, like we just got in this space and it didn't make any sense to keep moving when, you know, we could just like build up the, those funds that we had to spend. And when I say we, I'm talking about myself and the individuals who um, were helping to develop and cultivate the space with me. Um, and so January 1st. I had a physical space. I'm a business owner. I'm kicking it. I'm smiling. I'm happy. Happy New Year. Yada, yada, yada. In fact, I went to the freaking Keishanada concert. I'm kicking it. You know what I'm saying? January 9, literally like a full week and day later, I get a letter serving me a notice that I had less than 30 days to vacate because the building had been sold. The new buyers were developers and they were planning on renovating the entire thing. They were flipping the building, turning it into something completely different. And therefore, my storefront space had to be vacated and it had to be vacated before February 1st. Um, So, of course, that shit knocked the wind out of my sails. It made me feel like I like between the first and the 30th of January, I went through so many emotions, so much just chaotic, you know, craziness. And in the midst of all of that, I still had to keep in mind that January is my children's birthday month. So I had to be the mom that's planning how we're going to celebrate. I just came down from doing all kinds of stuff for them for Christmas um because I, I come from a family we celebrate it all we do the quads we do chris we do the thanks we do the, all the shits so we do we, we went they you know went way big and so i'm coming from this high of like i'm providing all of this for my children i'm doing so good i'm a you know i'm out here i'm a kick-ass mom and then things just started tanking and tanking and sinking and sinking and so at that point when the when I had to take that last box out. I held I held on for a, a while. But when that last day came where it was time to relinquish the keys and take the last boxes and like close the property and shut things down for the last time, I literally broke. I broke. And I was depressed for like days. You know what I'm saying? I already battled with depression, but like I had an episode that was the longest one that I probably had had since being postpartum. And in that space, I wanted to abandon ship. I didn't want to be responsible for shit. I wanted to like mentally check out, get in my car and drive till the gas ran out and just sit wherever I was and just be there with my thoughts, with my guilt, with my grief, with my shame, because that, that, was, that was shameful. My, the sign is still there at the physical address right now. And that's a slap in my face because it's like, I thought y'all were gonna develop, I thought y'all were developing this. I thought y'all were kicking me out to develop this. But if you were developing it, then why is the sign still on on the storefronts? You know what I mean? So experiencing all of those things um, definitely made me reevaluate what success looks like for me. And it's a big, big, uh reality check that you can be in your career for a long fucking time and be spinning your wheels you know because if me chasing what i thought was the success of a physical brick and mortar location employees 
booked out the ass all that shit if that was something that i had in my hands and now i don't have it in my hands anymore now at this point in time i have to be okay with that i have to i have to say i had i no longer have am i still successful yes or no you know what i'm saying and that's for me to make that decision and that process in making that decision is very difficult it's necessary but it's <clears throat> very very hard i want to like it's like buddy and it's just <laughs> no because it's like i feel like this is useful for you yeah yeah and it's it's literally i don't know if you know will 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 um will walton endless edge fashion designer chicago killing shit never heard but i'm yeah. sure I'll, i'm gonna look up yeah amazing brand you know i i got his hoodie like i love like the mission that it stands by but i just had him on last week yeah and and it, it's like it just it clicked in my head like what he was saying was like you know he's been doing his business for five years so he's still at that point of growing he has a brick and mortar but but he he mentioned this thing it's like obviously you're not a beginner mm -hmm. but it's beginner's luck and then beginner's luck wears out yes and and literally what what i hear that's exactly what it sounds like like that we buck to the ass employees brick and mortar and it's like, because like you're not a beginner at cosmetology, but like at that brick and mortar, that new frontier, you were a beginner. Oh, at absolutely. You know, so it's like, but it's like beginner's luck wears out. Yes. And then it's like, what the fuck am I doing? Exactly. It, it, it's a paradigm shift, and, and it's like, it's crazy how like that's where you're at right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it's and it, and it's a point where it's it's a crossroads. Yes. It's it's my entire identity because you do something for eighteen years, that almost becomes your identity. You know. Yeah, I actually, my previous brand's um, logo and name was CJ the MUA. That was mm. it. I was literally identifying myself with my brand. I got so lost in my brand that it no longer became about me and fulfilling and developing and cultivating and doing. It became... Again, it was more of a, I have something to prove to people who don't think I can do this shit, you know? It's um, a chip on your shoulder. It was probably deeper than a chip, mm. to be quite honest. Because we're talking about the people closest to me either giving me unsolicited advice, um, critiquing, being cynical implying that I was taking the easy quote unquote way out instead of going through the academia route to become successful. Um so whatever's deeper than a chip is probably what I was feeling because I spent I can guarantee you that I spent at least 10 of those 18 years saying to myself after you know major milestones were hit or bigger clients were booked where are all those people that had something to say now? Where are all those people that had something to say now? It's like, I was giving them my success. I was giving it to them. And the fucked up thing about that was that I was giving it to them and they didn't know that that's what I, what I was doing. And so not receiving the, the validation back was fucking me up and propelling me to go harder. But I'm doing this for people that ain't even paying me no damn mind. Why? It's not fulfilling me. You know, it's a skill. It is a marker of uh, success as far as me being a disciplined person. And just because something wasn't easy, I didn't walk away from it. Because being a makeup artist, again, this conversation is not to shit on the work that I've done. It ain't easy. <laughs> and I still, and, and I did develop a love for it, but, but. It's one of those things where, you know how someone says, I have love for a person, but I'm not in love. I'm not enamored with makeup. No, I'm not. I don't romanticize it at all. I'm good at it. I know how to talk about it. I know how to make it sound simple and understandable to an untrained ear. And that is a skill that I developed. That's where it stops. But am I living and breathing and other. no i don't have that romanticized view about it like i did at one point and i realized that the romanticized view that i had wasn't really that that was just the fact that the blanket 
Exactly. And it was the chip on the shoulder of, oh, I'm going to be, you know, everything that folks said that I'm not going to be. And the proving people wrong aspect of it crossed over into the appeal of, oh, I love being a makeup artist. I'm, this is what I love to do. Everyone says that, oh, I can tell you love what you do. Eh, I love the interactions that I have. I love the conversations that I have. I love the exchanges. I love telling people to stop deprecating themselves because the self-loathing and the comments that people make about themselves breaks my heart sometimes especially because i'm like i'm here doing makeup for a milestone like you out here getting ready to either have a major life-changing event you're marking you know some sort of success in life because people don't get makeup done just to sit down and watch tv you know what i mean so i'm like why are we sitting here you telling me how bad your skin is when you just did some major shit that the next person in this room looking at you didn't get done you know what i mean so i love that part of it you know i love the com camaraderie in mm. seeing other people who look like me be successful you know they may not necessarily look like me as far as you know my racial background and things like that but i'm talking about people who feel like they were not uh accepted and welcomed in spaces that they were attempting to be in at one point but have now found you know the camaraderie here i, I fuss with that heavy you know but this is not something that i can sit here and say to you oh my god when i was a shorty i dreamed about doing this I did not. <laughs> the question, and it's, it's like, first of all, I just want to commend you mm -hmm. for like just being vulnerable. Of course. No, and just opening up yeah. about. Thank you. No, no, like I, I genuinely mean it. Yeah. I genuinely mean it because it's difficult, mm -hmm. to, especially when you bring family into it, you know, close ones who might listen yeah. to, to just, and not calling them out, but just being real, yeah. you know, and, but I want to piggyback on, on the, cause I feel like we, we hit a chord there and I feel like a lot of people could benefit from this is is like so me personally mm -hmm. you know i you know i cannot even sit here and pretend and say like i know how you feel because mm -hmm. i'm not type to cap like, i don't <laughs> yeah. i didn't go through that and that's yeah. okay yeah i'm not gonna you know but mm -hmm. there were situations where you know because i had dreads mm -hmm. i felt like i didn't belong so i definitely felt to a smaller degree that's that feeling of like yeah. i prove yeah. so let me overcompensate here let me overcompensate there oh yeah absolutely you know but but my thing is you know through your through your wisdom and experience you know, because a lot of there's a lot of people in your position who have a similar, you know, everyone has an individual experience who have a similar experience. You know, what what do you think is a way, a healthy way to, to go about, you know, pursuing your passion? But but from a healthy standpoint, and I'm not saying the way you pursued it was unhealthy because like the dots connect further. Away, oh, absolutely. You know, and but like. Basically, like, how would you do things differently? Like, what, 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 what would you say oh, would be yeah. a healthier approach to pursuing makeup, right, mm -hmm. and cosmetology, but for an empower point, not from a chip on a soldier, right? So, shoulder, <laughs> so my soldier, right? I tend to looking at us, <laughs> right? Not from a chip on the shoulder, not from a blanket, you know? Yeah. Um. To be honest with you, if I could go back and do it differently, um. I might, I, well, when I was graduating from high school, mm -hmm. I did bring up cosmetology because I did have an interest in hair. Um, I learned about Madam C.J. Walker and I was like, yo, I want to do that. Like, what? And then I did have an uphill battle with my hair because I had big 4C hair. You know what I'm saying? Like, gang, gang. yes, absolutely. Like, yeah, you see, three, three. B2B, years. It's a lot, gang, baby. I you know, see you got me. You, B2B you, bungalow. Yes, <laughs> period. But um, at that time, of course, you know, the self hatred in the community was real. The texturism was rampant. Um, so my curiosity in uh, cosmetology and just naturally gravitating toward it came from my own struggles with keeping my hair looking the way that I, you know, felt comfortable presenting myself in the streets. Um, and so when I did bring up the conversation to my parents, um, it got instantly shut down. And I do think if I had gone, if I could go back in time and do things a little differently, what I might have encouraged myself to do would have been to pursue 
um pursue dance continue to pursue dance but per try to find a space that would be inclusive because if I had done a little bit more digging at that time, it would have taken a long time. And I'm not saying it would have been an easy route, but I'm almost positive that I probably would have found some sort of community. Um, We're going to ignore it. We're going to ignore it because <laughs> it, it keeps happening. Right. So, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would have definitely told myself, like, you know, maybe... Maybe try to see what cosmetology school would look like. You know, maybe go to um, a meeting, like go on a tour. Because that was a thing. You know, it was it was the complete shutdown of it. It was like, hey, I'm thinking about it. You know, it was it was um when it was approached, it was approached in a way that was like, hey, parents, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? You know, more of like, I'm looking for your insight. And the feedback that I got back wasn't feedback. It was instructions. You're going to college. Not, we don't think this is a good idea for you. It's, this is what you're doing. You're not doing the other stuff. Because the other stuff is for someone who's not as smart as you. And that was what they felt was the best advice to give me because in being you know now in that position of being a parent and also going through a healing journey i did have to come to grips that my parents are just as human as the next and they were also processing things that i was not aware of at that time that probably navigated them down that thought process you know, and they were probably thinking that saying that to me was saving me from what could have potentially been a non-successful path. So I don't take that and express it and share it as like, you know, oh, mothers ain't believe in me. Like, no, my parents have been my biggest cheerleaders. They have been my biggest supporters. They have been rallied around me. And it's just the two of them. They've rallied around me, just the two of them with a stronger force than like a group of people so we're not saying it like you know oh my god they were horrible shitty people but i do think that because i valued their opinion so much i didn't have a lot of opinions really to base <laughs> you know a lot of my decisions on at that age um i took that sword. absolutely and if you don't know better you can't do better if you don't know better you cannot do better my better, my best shiny example of adulthood were the two people that raised me at that time. So I had no choice but to really turn and say, you know, I guess the people who, you know, got me to the point where I'm about to graduate would know what to tell me. You know what I mean? So I didn't feel that feeling of like, I'm going to rebel and do what I want to do because my parents don't know and I know better. And you know, I didn't have that. I felt very confident that they knew what they were talking about. Um, so in hindsight, of course, I would have said, I don't know if that is a choice that you should make because in my experience, I have not seen someone successful in that. But if this is what you wanna do, then I'm gonna introduce you to the avenue in which you can do it properly. Um, and that's, probably how I'm going to parent my kids when they get to that point because that is definitely something that you know in parenthood you're going to learn your lessons from your folks and I'm sorry in in childhood teenagehood and adulthood you're going to learn your lessons from your parents in one of two ways you're going to either take in the advice that they give you or you're going to watch them do things that lead to some sort of bump in the road that or will you know teach a life lesson to you that you are like okay I don't want to take that part of who my parents are with me into my journey those are the two ways that you're going to learn from your folks and that's it even if you have an absentee parent that's you're lesson. learning lessons from them with their absence so in that whole thing I feel like yeah like that's probably something that I would more than likely do 
different is just say, you know, you, if you want to pursue a career outside of what the popular options are, fine. We'll figure it out. If you decide that this is not for you, you're young enough to change your mind. All I ask is you figure it out. <laughs> I don't want to have a situation where I couldn't raise a person to be confident enough to make a decision and stick with it. You know what I'm saying? There's a difference between being an indecisive person naturally and being like really intimidated by some shit that you just can't figure it out. And I don't, I don't want the latter. Um, so in hindsight, if I to answer your question, if I could do anything different, it would be that. It would have been to just introduce the younger me into what it could have been like to pursue both. Because I could have been both a cosmetologist and dancer and then got to a crossroads where like, yo, I'm so blazed at both that I got to figure out whether I'm going to do this one full time or this one full time. For me, I kind of didn't even give myself the this or that. I gave myself the that. And now I'm looking and I'm saying, well, oh, damn, the this is still on the table. Let me pull that and see what that look like. You know what I mean? So that's the only thing that I probably would say would be different. Um, but experiences are the best teacher. Yes. So who's to say that I wasn't supposed to go through all that shit? You know, because now that I did go through that at about to be in the back half of my 30s. <laughs> later years young <laughs> of course <laughs> um i feel so empowered and so confident that i can actually say that my cup is full in that body love and that self-love and that acceptance that i can spread it to others I, I didn't start calling myself a body love advocate until literally 2022 because i didn't love my body enough in all of these years past to say that i was a body love advocate and if I hadn't gone through all of those things and if I hadn't had a career that required me to work through my own physical insecurities and work through my own Eurocentric, you know, wall, because <laughs> I, I was out there, I fried, died and permed all that type of shit when I was at a certain age. I was a grown up, but it was a decision that I made based on some shit that was seated in me in childhood. You know what I'm saying? If I hadn't gone through all of those experiences, who's to say that I would be able to call myself a body love advocate right now? You know, so mm -hmm. you never know. You never know. And you got to just kind of say, well, I'm going to do the best with the circumstances that have been placed in my way. Mm -hmm. Because if I always wonder what if there's really a potential that I could never be satisfied with any decisions that I've made you know what I'm saying and I never want to spend life is too short it's too precious it's not guaranteed I don't want to spend any of the years that have been gifted to me wondering whether or not I made a decision that ultimately in that time in that space I was doing what was best for myself then you know what I'm saying like mm -hmm. why should I why should I look back and say damn was that a good idea like bruh the shit that you had on your mind in 2015 versus the shit that you had on, on your mind in 2022 is not going to be the same thing. Pandemic notwithstanding. So why turn around and be like, damn, I wonder what would have happened if I had made that decision. Because honestly speaking, on some butterfly effect shit, if I hadn't made certain decisions that I had made, I wouldn't have, I would not be a Chicago resident. And, you know, I'm not even originally from here. I would not be a mom. I would not be, you know, out here being outspoken and vocal about certain topics because I would have never had the arena to step in to, like, start going through the thought process to say, how do I feel about this? You know, so I don't, I don't know if even showing the younger me the options would have been the right right decision to make because that shit could have knocked all the things that we're talking about now off the table and you might not even be sitting here having this conversation with me because of some shit that I did differently back in that time you know in that space so 
we don't always want to learn our lessons the hard way but at the same time those are the ones that are more valuable anyway like you're not gonna value some shit that you didn't have to work for you know Boring people but <laughs> <laughs> you know i had to throw a little something there on that note <laughs> let's feel the, 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 the blood comes out <laughs> I'm crying. The blood comes out. You feel me? The clouds blocking the sun. You feel me? We got the we got the asparagus. We got the watermelon. The watermelon is calling me. You feel me? Welcome to the Treehouse Show. Um, the trillest podcast in the universe. Please indulge yourself. I know you, you fucking with the watermelon. So. I fucked with some watermelon before we got started. You know what I'm yes. Mm. I'm not trying to be smacking on these good people's earlobes. No. no, no, no. <laughs> Listen, the treehouse show. I love y'all, but y'all, you know, what I'm saying y'all might need some therapy because they be they be liking that ASMR. They be <laughs> that tap tap tap. Shit. They be do that do that a little more. I'm like, yo, chill. Hey, yo. <laughs> yo, this is the treehouse show. Mean, but listen, I'm not. So it's not, people out here making. I'm gonna get my bag though. Off that tap, if tap. I got, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, like do y'all do y'all Listen, career change like a motherfucker. <laughs> Career change like a motherfucker. Well, here's some some e-smoke ASMR. Visual smoke. You feel me? Yes, take all that in. Thank you so much for providing that point of view, you know? Of course. Because a lot of people are in their life journey. A lot of people are, you know, experimenting, you know, with how how to go, how to navigate life in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are learning lessons. A lot of people getting their ass kicked. You oh, feel yeah. me? And, it, and a lot of people on the, on the verge of giving up, you know? So it, hearing a story like that, you know, of like seeing all that you've built and then, you know, for something that you, you know, put a, put a lot of your eggs in that basket, not, you know, but then I love seeing the the other side of that. But let's dig more into the other, the other side sure. of that. What were some of the, I call them the blessings or what? And it's not even to put like a good or bad spin on it, but what what were some of the ways you looked at life differently following, you know, your your physical location? Well, um, the biggest takeaway from the whole thing is the lesson of duality. That's my biggest lesson in that entire experience. There are highs and lows to every experience that you have in this life. It doesn't matter if it's um, something that you chose or something that was placed in your path. You're going to have a high and you're going to experience a low. Um, It doesn't mean that the high and the low is going to be as extreme as mine. But you have to prepare yourself because it can be. And I'll be honest with you, I was not prepared for that shit. I was not prepared mentally. I was not prepared for what if your business does not go through and you have nothing to do with it. Because that's the wild card about the whole thing. That physical space being gone had nothing to do with me. In fact, the shit was going down while I was coming in and out that building doing a regular day's work completely and totally in the dark about it. Wondering like... Thinking that the people that were coming around looking at the place were looking to come and, like, see where repairs were needed or, you know, just doing average building maintenance type shit. Not, like, the maintenance guy, but, like, maybe the contractor or something. Yeah. So, um, the biggest thing in that was, yeah, was the the lesson of the, of, you know, duality and being prepared for... Um, experiencing uh, what the lows of entrepreneurship really feel like. You know, everybody on LLC Twitter and LLC Insta, LLC TikTok always got these easy hacks to, you know, propel your business. Yeah, I, yeah. I I went from da 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 to da da da. Like, and I'm not saying that I got bamboozled by LLC Twitter in any kind of way. But what I am saying is that that false sense of 
if you just keep doing this and you stay diligent and you don't let anything in every circumstance and all these obstacles get in your way, the success train is coming. Um, the success train has pee on the floor mm. and graffiti. Not the good graffiti either. Mm. The penises. <laughs> drawn on the train car like <laughs> they the don't tell signs. you that part right <laughs> they don't tell you your metro car that you get is, they rip you it. know yeah like they don't it's little shit under the table that gets left out of that Clean conversation up on four. so in that in that experience I also learned that like um as much as we like to think that all it takes is determination. It takes formal business training too. Mm. I'm not business trained. I didn't go to school to be a business owner. I didn't attend any formal classroom instruction, whether it was collegiate, high school, some sort of learning incentive intensive that I pay for out of pocket, a seminar or something. I didn't have that. I had, I want to own a studio. I know how much things cost in order to buy them and put them in my space. I know how much the rent costs. I know how many people I need to hire in order to make a profit from the business as well. I knew those things, but I knew them because that was like low key, the level of like the ABCs and the one, two, threes of business. The other shit, the legal stuff, the insurance, the investing, the pitching, the all, like so much. There's no wonder that people have to have MBAs and masters and things like that. And it's fucked up because on one end, you know that the educational system is race, racist as hell. You know what I'm saying? Institutionalized education in this country is not only lackluster because we rank so low against the rest of the world. However, in order to get some sort of crack in the door here, you got to know the game and have a go. You got to. You got to. You got to. And this is no longer the, the this is no longer the, the world of. You know, oh, this is my neighbor. We we live right down the street, and we skin folk, and we you know we see our kids grow up together. Don't nobody give no goddamn one iota of an ounce about your back sob story as to what you got going on in your life. You know, what's your what's your business? What's your product? Is it affordable? Okay, that's what people care about. And the mechanics of things, I, I have to say that, like, I did not know the full ins and outs walking into that situation. And in hindsight, I had to hold myself accountable and say, baby, you wrote a check, your ass could not cash. That's it. You wrote a check. It bounced <clears throat> from the bank of life. And you now have to clean up after your mess. And fortunately, you were wise enough not to put all of your life's work into this physical space because your uh, skill is in your body, is in your facilities. You don't need this building to continue to do what you do. And that was the... I'm glad I covered my ass with a little insurance. You know what I'm saying? But ultimately, I wrote a check that my ass could not cash. It bounced. And the feelings of failure, of shame, of, you know, just wondering at that brief point in time, wondering if this was going to be the one mistake that I made that was going to fuck me up moving forward for a long time. Those feelings were things that I had never had to process ever in my life, ever. Because I spent so much time from <clears throat> comparing notes of, oh, when I started versus now, when I started versus now. Well, the brick and mortar shit started in 2020. So we talking about somebody going into this business with experience 
of what's needed to like the day to day and the ins and outs, but not the other shit. So there's guilt there because it's like, I thought I knew better, but apparently I didn't. And those feelings, experiencing them, seeing them, even though, yes, the shit was hard, it hurt. I hated those feelings. Some days I ain't gonna hold you. I did not want to get up out of the bed. Some days I didn't get out of the, out of the bed. I, one day I literally came into my mom's bedroom and told her, I can't do this today. And I did an about face and I walked in my room. I closed the door and I locked it and I slept the entire day. Did not get up and eat, did not drink water, barely went to the bathroom because I mentally just did not want to feel the feelings that I had been experiencing in that journey. And so looking at it though, that shit was hella important. Because guess what? Even though that shit was something that I really wish I didn't have to go through, going through it and experiencing how that shit felt and most importantly not having some of the people who were there for me or should I say that I thought were there for me in the very beginning stages of that were not there in the closing down and so experiencing all of that and experiencing it while friendships are changing and things like that um, it made me realize that the weight of what could happen should things go left is so heavy that if I make that decision again, I better know what the fuck I'm doing. And not only but I not only had I better know what the fuck I'm doing, I'd better be so committed and ready for either circumstance that regardless of what the outcome is, is not gonna rock me the way that that shit rocked me this year. That's it. I can't predict shit else. But I can say I, I better be fucking prepared. I damn sure better be prepared. And that's a big ass lesson that we need in all <laughs> categories of life. Not just business entrepreneurship. You know what I'm saying? You got to yeah. be mentally prepared for shit. And the crazy shit is you would think that me being, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I moved to another big city like Chicago. I'm, you know, in an arena that I've never been in before when it comes to, you know, meeting these business uh, owners and, you know, because of course, you know, once you, once people know that you have a space, the other people that own their businesses on the street are coming in there to come speak to you and they want to chop it up with you about shit. And I'm sitting there like, what? You speaking in fucking... I don't even know what language this is. This is some fucking Star Trek sound and shit. Like, bro, what are you saying? Like, huh? All I know is I pay my rent. I'm moving some shit in here. <laughs> and I got a client at four. <laughs> like, what the fuck are we talking about right now? But it, it it really let me know, like, yo, I was not prepared. I was not. And I, I, I used to say, I wish that somebody had been there to tell me. I wish that somebody had been there. No. No. No, the accountability is you can't rely on other people to prepare you for shit. You have to prepare yourself if that's what you want to do. And if someone drops a gem, that's from the kindness. That's from their good graces. That's not out of obligation. Unfortunately, people don't have that sense of I feel obligated to the next person like that anymore. You know, and I don't know if it'll ever come back but i know my takeaway from this whole experience has been like the next time that i make a very heavy business decision i am not going to walk into that unprepared and i'm not going to walk into it um without the, the backup exactly because the because it was definitely me me opening up that space was definitely like on some excuse me it was definitely on some i got some shit to prove to people that's that's the lesson not to cut you off but that that's, no, you're good that's the that's the bigger lesson i'm and first of all thanks for sharing that story mm -hmm, of course but that's the bigger lesson i'm taking from this oh yeah it's like beyond the be better prepared next time beyond the 
um, accountability. Beyond the, you know what I'm saying? Okay, people so-and-so. Now I know who, who friends, whatever. And all of that huge, important lessons. The lesson I'm taking is the lesson that you are at now, which is you are one step closer to your calling now because of that. Mm-hmm. Body, love, advocate. See, like you said, 2022. That's post all of this, if I'm correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Think about if, and it's like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, all, like with all of my intention, you know, and your intention, we wanted to see that business grow, obviously. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. however, you know, like you said, over the phone, you were like, through that, you know, that loss, you got, and it's like, it's like, yeah, okay, that's not like a monetary gain, like body love advocate, like where's the money? Like some people are like, oh, where's the financial or where's the whatever? But it's not that, it's bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Because we've you've built your life and we've seen people build their lives not out of material things. They they built their lives of authenticity, of integrity, right, of, of purpose. It's built out of a sense of who you are. Mm-hmm. And until you find out who you are. Everything that you do will continue to be a reflection, a reminder of everything you're not. I no matter how much you try to band-aid it, no matter how much mm-hmm. you try to put a cast, a tourniquet, blanket, it doesn't matter. It's a it's a monster, and the monster could be a lot of things. For some people, for some people the monster is material. For some people the monster is validation. Some, for some people the monster is just insecurity. Mm-hmm. Of how they really feel about themselves based off of a paradigm that they've never healed from. Absolutely. You know, there's there's so many levels to that. But but above all else, what I value from from this conversation and, mm-hmm. and just you being vulnerable is the sense of integrity through it all. Oh yes. What what why is integrity so important to you? Like why what, or maybe it was a journey to get to that mm-hmm. point. But for over the phone, the vibe I got was like, you know, even with clients and being in a space. You really value like who it is and and the, the how did that become so and why is that so important to you? So I went through um, a couple of cycles of uh, interpersonal relationships that fizzled out. They they started off strong, fizzled out, cycled that several times over. Um, and so at one point I told myself, yo, the common denominator is me. Mm. It doesn't mean that I'm the reason why these are, these things are happening, but it's, it goes back to that discern thing where I had to stop and really think and say, is this person someone that I'm calling my friend because I have fun with them? And I am sharing common interests with them? Or is this someone who is, you know, a real friend who is fulfilling, you know, certain things that I'm fulfilling in them as well? And, you know, we have have bonds and conversations that are growth-centered and community and love minded because I don't expect the world to be my community but I damn sure expect my close knit circle to be my community um so how that began in my personal life it literally just ended up resonating in everything else that's the honest answer um once you start doing something so much you adapt to it and it becomes your lifestyle you no longer think about it it's almost like a muscle memory mm-hmm. that's low key like how i am now when it comes to being a person of integrity and a person of i really don't give a fuck if being <clears throat> authentic and being honest uh brings in people who don't want to pick up what I am putting down because it's not for everyone to pick up. Um, That's what literally being a person of integrity means. It means that I'm very comfortable in not doing harm that those who could potentially put me in that slippery slope are turned off to want to even associate with me because they're into some shady shit that energetically is not 
going to link with me regardless. Um, and again, that just like literally resonates with my clients. I don't take a certain type of clientele. Um, and when I say that, let me clarify before mm. folks get yeah. snappy I feel, I feel and sassy. Right, because I know you, I know you mm -hmm. folks like to tussle. No, when I say I don't take a certain type of clientele, what I mean is <clears throat> um, I prefer to do work with clients who have a backstory as to why they need me. I don't want the type of client who I just, I don't like the way that I look outside without a, a face on. So I need someone and I just don't feel like always doing it myself. So I need someone to come and just do my makeup. Like, what? <laughs> I don't care how much money you have to pay me. I'm not here to be nobody's personal, like, at your disposal type of situation. No. You know what I'm saying? Now, there's reasons and context to everything. If a person needs a full-time, you know, whoever, because they're growing in their career and there is a need and you're going to be looking to book me so much that it makes no sense to even do the booking process and you just want a salary, fine. That's a different situation. But there's a different, there's just an air about just doing what I do. You're going to run into that. You're going to run into the, I genuinely need someone because I'm struggling versus I'm doing this shit because I'm just trying to keep up with appearances and it looks really, really fucking good to tell people that I got a personal whoever, personal stylist, MUA, whatever. Um, and I don't do the latter. If that means that I'm not going to get a certain amount of bread, well, I'm just going to have to learn to live within my means. But what I'm not ever going to do is be treated, spoken to, um, handled in a way that compromises the fact that like I worked really fucking hard to do what it is that I do regardless of how I felt in that personal space. You know what I'm saying? And so you will respect that. And someone who has, you know, the inability to understand and connect and respect the amount of discipline that it takes to do what I do could never be a client of mine. Um, so that's what I mean when I say there's a certain type of clientele like I just won't take. Um, I don't do proms anymore. <laughs> oh, you said awesome. Full, no shade, full shade. <laughs> I love y'all congrats class of 22 but yeah no I, I that's the one thing I won't do and it's not because I don't want to do prom kids it's because it's just a lot of volume like you find out you know a school finds out uh you find your one student finds out that you're able to do makeup for you know one student of course word gets around you got six kids that are all going to the same prom on the same night that want you and you're like yeah, I don't know. You know, so that part of things, um, I definitely don't do it anymore. I just all just some like, nah, I done paid my dues, shorty. I'm good. Um, but yeah, I, I am very, very big on making sure that my client understands that you're not gonna get someone who can't produce the results that they see speak that you know what I'm saying they say they have and if it is something that's out of my range my integrity kicks in and says that's not something that I can do I'm I do a certain style of makeup application and that's another thing that I have to be comfortable with and say like you know I had to look I had to look at it like how you look at music you know what I'm saying Robert Glasper is not trying to compete with future mm. but both of them have a strong ass fan base and people who will literally go to war if you speak ill of their work. So with that being said, there's no reason why a CJ Iman can't remain a CJ Iman and be the best CJ Iman. I don't have to compete with an artist that might have a blue check on social media because that person's style is what got them that. My style and my, you know, 
skill set and what I do and what I'm known for is what gets me there. So I just need to pretty much continue to be my authentic authentic self. It's past not competing because there's going to be competition in business no matter what. It wouldn't be called business. But what you do have to do is say, um, I'm more focused on my reputation and I'm going to allow that to be what brings me in the money and let those two work you know in conjunction with each other as opposed to what's out here trending what what's gonna bring in the dollars what is everybody on what's this you know what's the shit that's hot right now like i'm not the what's the shit that's hot right now mua i'm not you know i'm not i'm i'm not saying that I'm not going to ever get booked for anything that would potentially be considered a modern, new, mainstream, whatever you want to call it. But also at the same time, being authentic and being someone who is um, now at a place of acceptance, I realized that like the reason why my clients are my clients and the reason why they come to me is because they like the way that I do what I do the way that I do it. And there's no one else that can replicate that. And that's okay. It's totally fine. Like, it's not a slight against me the mm. way that someone would try to put a spin on it and say, oh, well, you know, oh, you've been in, you've been in the game X amount of years and you ain't got all these other credits. Like, <laughs> but I got credits. <laughs> but, that's, but that's the trap. <laughs> yeah. But that's the ego trap. Mm-hmm. Because, like, yeah, I'll say you rub it off, but like, that gets to you, low key. Oh, yeah. It can get to you if you haven't. You and know. it did. It did. It, it, I, when I was dealing with the brick and mortar closing, I brought that up very openly. I'm so on my social media. I'm very honest. I'm very authentic. I and see. I've yeah. Said, I'm yeah. Fuck with your posts. I mean. Thank you. I've yeah. said it on more than one occasion that I am not someone who's only going to share the good on my on my account. I I can't do that. And there are people that can do it. Expert. And I tip my hat because I wish that I can only show people good shit. But no, like when I am not a sunshine and roses person, I need to be honest about that shit. You feel me? So I've said it on my social media that like I felt a way that during my most difficult and heaviest point of my career, that I was dealing with the feelings of loneliness and feelings of minimal to no support, you know? Um, and of course, those are things that are very natural to feel. It, I'm not going to invalidate ever how I felt about anything. But what I will say is that in that space, you know, um, I had to understand that the people that did show up for me needed my attention more than the people that did not. And so I stopped really zeroing in on that because ultimately it was like, to me, the equivalent of giving those other people who had held me down kind of like my back, you know, my ass to kiss to say like, y'all help me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's talk about y'all motherfuckers that wasn't there. Like, wow. (laughs) You know, so, um, I just basically took that whole that whole experience and and just pretty much said like at the end of the day um you're gonna go through so so many fucking like emotions and and process and I also had to just kind of like check in recently with myself and say the same thing like hey just because the weather's changing because all of this happened in the very top of the year you know Mm -hmm. and so just mentally you get fooled into thinking like okay seasons are changing time is going by this was a while ago no 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 this is still very fresh um doing that check-in and say like yeah are you know how you holding up in all of this like just processing all of those feelings um without having the overwhelming feeling of community Mm. was something that i had to really just sit in and tell myself that yo yeah you feel the way about this shit this is not easy in fact it hurts really bad 
Because it's niggas out here that you remember, you know, doing free gigs with. Doing the dark CD, like, are we really doing makeup in the bathroom? Like, this is disgusting. Type of, you know, back in the day, back in the day. That I'm just like, you mean to tell me that, like, you can't text the nigga to just see how you doing? You know, like, a quick, hey, let's go out for a drink or, you know, let's. Let's at least have a Zoom combo, a FaceTime call, something, you know, so not experiencing, you know, the feelings of, you know, hey, people are thinking about me. People are checking in. But you see them that. like your post. Hmm? You see them like your post. You, you see them. Oh, yeah. You see them know what oh, you're going yeah. through. Yeah. That shit was a special kind of hell. Definitely was. Um, but I had to, yeah, I had to just kind of like say, look, for whatever reason, this is the way that you're supposed to be processing this. You're not supposed to be processing this with a bunch of people around you. It fucking sucks. It hurts. Say how you feel. Express the feelings. Acknowledge them. And do what you got to do to move through them. Don't get over them. But move through them. Because at the end of the day, you know, getting over something takes time. So don't sit here and try to push yourself to block out whatever. Um, but work through shit. You feel me? And be okay with the idea of removing yourself from, you know, being in close proximity to people who hurt your feelings. And that's okay. And, and a download I just got right now is literally, it's coming full circle. Mm -hmm. You know, like even you describing your personality, like your mom, like, oh, she's, we're not gonna have a problem with her being an introvert. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. And that's, that's that, that's that nurture. Yeah. That's, that's you and it's like people people me me now people it's like that so it's like and it's like even okay cosmetology you know okay i'm good at this mm -hmm. accolades you know yeah. big shows big events so and so network you know whatever store cluster booked you know and people now people both, external you know, external yeah. external so the universe said Oh, we gonna you go through some shit, and we gonna no take external. all the motherfuckers exactly. like who you was going. Because that's that was your comfort zone. Oh, if, yeah. if, 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 if what I'm interpreting, mm -hmm. what what I want to add to though, I do want to go back to the the reputation part. Yeah, because I, I feel like a lot of people, you know, maybe not as far along in the whatever career they're doing, but just the media entertainment industry. Yeah, it's easy to to compromise who you are, and it's easy yeah. to. See, like, see yourself not fitting in being you, mm -hmm. but but then, like, not like you, like, deciding, like, okay, nah, I'm going to just be me. And you kind of did your thing. Oh, go crazy, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, um, but also, like, I feel like some people might find it hard. Like, what, what would you have to say about just that entertainment industry working in there and, you know, how how people, how you see people kind of navigating it, you know? Thank you so much for sharing that. My question is, from your experience, from your time working with, you know, big names, working on sets, you know, being in the trailers, mm -hmm. you know, what what was that experience like? And, you know, what what advice could you give for, like, young entrepreneurs, you know, aestheticians, mm -hmm. cosmetologists kind of getting into that, of how they can carry themselves and still be, you know be them yeah. you know still have be successful but like you know kind of tr tr trim that line right yeah um as far as appearances go um make sure whatever you're doing uh is intentional you know um if you're gonna do a uh, colorful hair you know make sure that you're hair color looks like you intended for it to be you know whatever vibrant shade you know don't look like some weird experiment that is like fried and faded you know what i mean like in in, in other words whatever it is that you're doing in this um industry uh appearances are extremely important and appearances doesn't always mean that you look um done up but you do have to look like you know what you're doing. And if you're coming in and looks like you tried to do something that was botched, you are going to leave the impression of someone who's never seen your work before in person that you may not know exactly what you got to do. 
Um, so that's one thing. And if you gotta take the time and go get some shit done professionally, just do it. You feel me? Like there's there's arenas um that welcome people who are in that, you know, space of trying to develop their brand and develop their look that will take you in under their wing and help you figure all that out. Um, that's definitely a part of branding, you know, yourself as a professional in an industry that's based on visuals. Um, if you're in a position where you can't necessarily afford those things because you're in, you know, a financial bind, the more important thing is to make sure that you develop a, a makeup kit or any kit that you're using, hair kit, a skincare kit, whatever, you know what a kit is if you're a professional. You know, if you're not in the industry, your kit is basically, it's literally what it is. It's your collection of items and tools that you use to do your job and do it well. Um, so, uh, you know, you're being a kit minded person will take you far than being worried about um, branding yourself first. You know, there is a hierarchy and a, and a um, order of operations, if you will, to segue yourself from an enthusiast to a professional. Mm. There's a reason why a pro MUA is not always going to look, quote unquote, fancy. There's a difference between being polished, put together, looking like you know what you're doing and looking fancy. Because the fancy ones is usually the ones that it's like, yeah, you had a little bit too much time to get ready for this gig. I don't know. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely uh, it's, there's a, a fine line that you need to walk when it comes to your own vanity versus like making sure your appearance looks like it's up to par. Um, as far as being on set is concerned, be a sponge, be a sponge. If you, if you see someone chilling on their phone on set, it's, trust me, they paid their dues to do that. If you don't know what you're doing, if you can count on one hand, how many years of experience you've had being on a set specifically, put that phone away, put that social media away. Yes, you can have moments to get behind the scenes footage. Yes, there will be times for that. You can even ask a seasoned person on set, hey, I'm trying to learn how to do X, Y, and Z. Do you mind taking a couple of shots and sending them to my phone? Do that. You know, um, check your ego. Check your ego in any uh, production that you walk on, whether it's an uh, in-person, you know, event, or a fashion show or um you know whatever check your ego because i can guarantee you there's somebody in that room that can probably do your job and four more jobs seamlessly and you wouldn't know it because they in there chilling you know what i'm saying that's the type of energy that sets one we don't like devos we don't like divas we don't we don't, we don't, we don't. Take that shit to the stage if you're a performer. You feel me? Put that that mentality into whatever it is that, you know, you're supposed to do. But as far as, like, being that person, nah, bruh. <laughs> leave that in the car. Leave that on the train. Like, leave that at the crib. <laughs> Whatever you, however you got here, leave it in the Uber. Like, <laughs> don't even bring it on set. Um... And then the most important thing is just understand that, like, we all are creative geniuses. Because it, it takes a level of genius to do art professionally for a living. You know what I'm saying? Full time, if you're full time. Um, enjoy that shit. Enjoy the fact that you were chosen to be a part of this shit. You don't know what it's going to take. People don't, you know what I'm saying, don't know the magnitude of what their projects are going to do after they're done. No one ever does. You know what I'm saying? Like... The dude that was shooting Kanye's footage, he wasn't thinking that was going to turn into some billion fucking viewer Netflix thing, you know? So it's the same same thing. Just if you go in authentic and ready to, you know, put whatever your contribution is to the table out there, 
and let everything else <clears throat> and let everything else kind of like domino effect organically you'll be fine like that's that's the most important thing um mm. all the other shit be on time god if i could say that in all caps i would mm. yeah be on time um be personable good morning good evening like I can't tell you how many productions I've been on where the only people that are speaking is uh, HMUA because everybody else is just grumpy and in introverted and to themselves. And I mean, folks warm up, but it's just like, come on, man. I don't want to always be the icebreaker, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, just for us, I'll say this. I don't work with every hair stylist and every makeup artist in the city, no. But the ones that I do work with, I've been working with them consistently for enough time where we know what our energy is that we are wanting to bring to a gig. So if the set is all in there, whatever vibe that they got going on, trust and believe wherever hair and makeup is at, we over there kicking it. We know what we're doing though. We know what we're doing. And that's the big thing. In order for you to get to that point where you kicking it on the clock, you got to know what you're doing. Like, if you need a little more work, a little more polish, maybe the music on a lower volume. You know what I'm saying? Maybe we don't sit down when uh, the talent is going on in front of the camera. Maybe we follow the talent to go see what it looks like in the light so that we can go and be ready if the director... Or whoever says, hey, we need hair, we need makeup. Um, so that's, that would probably be like my most like basic of the basic gems to drop. Um, also, you know, there is definitely such thing as paying your dues. So if you're trying to get started, um, just expect to be paid not that much if anything at all at certain you know levels of experience it's not fair but that's the reason why a lot of artists start out with a side hustle and you know do the art as like divided up you know divide up their time do it in their free time that's part of the reason why because at the end of the day these production companies that have these real budgets that you can start saying run my checks they're like well prove to me why i should run my check and it's not fair it's not fair i'm not saying that it should be this way if it was a perfect world you'd be able to like do all of this rc you know skill shit when you were in high school and graduate and go find you a paying job just like everything else but in the art world it don't work like that you know in the movie world it don't work like that same thing with pretty much anything that requires you to modify a person's appearance you're gonna have to show that you know what you're doing you know um so that's a big one that unfortunately does leave a lot of room for you know people to be overlooked because if you're not putting your name out there you know i <laughs> I remember being that person when I first got to Chicago, I didn't know anyone at all <laughs> except my mama. And I was, you know, brave enough to go on that good old internet and find free and experience, you know, you'll get your, what is it, trade for prints hmm. type of work where you do the makeup and they give you your pictures, the compensation is the pictures back. Uh, so, I mean, hey, if I could do it, and I'm from, you know, a big-ass city where folks will cut their eyes and, you know, pretty much cuss you out for asking what time it is, like, <laughs> if I can do it, you know, the, I think that the next one can do it too, um, until the system changes, if there are people that want to, you know, change the way that uh makeup artists get their start, or, you know, anyone that's in that field, I, my, I keep going back to makeup artistry because of course that's the one that I have the longest yeah. experience doing um yeah that would basically be my advice now what I will say for those listening that are not black y'all need to learn how to do 
are everything. <laughs> Y'all do. Y'all need to learn how to do all of our shit. Everything. And don't just half-ass it. You need to have the same products in the kit that we need. You need to have the tools that we use. You need to have everything. Everything. And if it takes you walking up, I'll never forget this. So I was doing um, a makeup project with uh, the organization Coffee, Hip Hop, and Mental Health. And one of the artists that were there is not black. Um, I believe uh, the pronouns are she, her, so I'm going to say she. Um, she came up to me literally out of nowhere and said, hey, when you have a minute, would you mind showing me how you... I was sponge, cur uh, sponge curling mm -hmm. one of the talent's hair. Mm-hmm. And putting some uh, grease. You know how like right after you get a fresh cut, mm -hmm. you know, you smooth everything down, make sure the line is in. I was doing all of that stuff. And she literally just came up to me and just asked. And said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful and I'm not trying to look at you like you're some sort of science experiment. But I really want to learn how to do this. Because I'm hired to work on projects with people who have the same hair texture. And I don't know how to make these curls do that. Mm. What was hard about that? That was amazing. If I could have that type of interaction with all the other non-black artists that I've ever worked with, I could guarantee you that the complaints would be drastically reduced about how people who are not black don't know how to do hair and makeup um, on black skin and uh, black hair. You know, And it also trans translates over to the fashion world too. Um, which again is how, you know, everything with the whole body love, um, advocacy that I've become involved with has happened, but it all kind of ties into the whole, like dismantling that Eurocentric shit. And the best way to do that is to figure us, learn us, learn us, you know what I'm saying? Like not figure us out, but like learn us, or should I say, learn what you need to know and understand in order for us to feel just as comfortable as the people who you make feel comfortable because you resonate and they look like you. I don't only have black clients. I have a lot of black clients, but I don't only service black clients. I also don't only service women identifying clients. I service people that don't look like me, that have privileges that I don't. And to be able to do that was a choice that I made because I could have easily stuck and said, I'm black. I know how to do my people. I'm going to do my people. And that's it. But guess what? If a corporation has hired me and they also pick the talent and I have no idea who the talent is until they send me an email like a night or two before. I didn't have a hand in picking out who's getting casted. So... I got to know how to do somebody who may not look like me. You know what I'm saying? I have no choice. So it's bullshit when you hear these stories about how these black individuals sit down on these professional sets and have the worst experiences with, to the point where they're walking in with their own kit prepared for someone to not know what they're doing. That shit is fucked up. It's fucked up on so many levels because it speaks to the lack of um, acknowledgement. That and also the lack of effort that these producers are showing by not doing the work to find someone who can. You know what I'm saying? That shit, we shouldn't be someone who has been doing hair, makeup, freelancing anything of that nature on a on a set where the talent is going to be a diverse cast they should never tell someone can you bring your products in the room because i don't have anything that i can i don't have anything in my kit that i can use on you but guess how many times black people have heard that it's crazy so that is the most i think important thing to take away from you know, anything that I just said as far as getting your start. If you ain't black, because nine times out of ten of you black, we have, like, we have 
we have a natural, um, I think, just culturally, as far as, uh, you know, black Americans, we have that natural knack to adapt and learn other people and make them feel because that's what we were forced to do no matter what. And of course, you know, generational muscle memory is real. You know what I'm saying? I don't do it as much as I used to, but I used to find myself purposely code switching so that if a white girl was in the room or a white dude was in the room, he didn't feel intimidated by my New York accent. Or, you know, if I'm going to a place where I have a whole bunch of white coworkers, all of a sudden I'm noticing that my clothing is becoming more subdued and more under, you know, understated than being a little bit more flashy, wearing the earrings that might be this big, you know, or now I'm wearing these little studs because I'm around people who, you know, oh, they don't know about the hoop thing, you know? Yeah, like not not uh snapping my neck and moving when I'm talking in certain gestures, like all of those things, exactly. All of those instinctive things that we do to accommodate those that don't look like us. We got that shit naturally to the point where we have to tell ourselves to shut it off so that's why i don't worry about us when it comes to whether or not we're going to be able to do hair or makeup or style people who don't look like what we look like but i worry about individuals who are not black in the reverse because the way this the side you know the way society has can has created the atmosphere we come last no matter what in the world's eyes in society's eyes especially in american society's eyes so the priority to figure us out has never been put out there it's only been placed out there as a marketing tool the campaigns that were created when the afros and all of those movements were becoming mainstream there were some black marketers out there who were taking the over and doing authentic advertisement but also on the flip side of that, companies like Johnson & Johnson were using that shit to fool and bamboozle and put poison into the black community. So I don't expect people who don't look like us to have the natural knack in understanding that I need to figure out how to make this person feel welcome and included and comfortable in my chair. So that, <laughs> honestly speaking, is the number one, like, barrier to me of what needs to be knocked down when it comes to the success of seeing other makeup artists, hairstylists, cosmetologists, estheticians who are brown, black, um, in general. We need to be seen as... First of all, we need to be seen as human. Then once we are finally seen as human and recognized as human, we need to be seen as our own identifying individuals. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not going to pull out the same products that I use on someone who identifies as a, a black person, an African-American person, <clears throat> that I would on someone who identifies as an Indian person. And when I say Indian, I'm talking about South Asian versus another person who identifies as Filipino like we need to start being comfortable and okay with people's um desire to want to look like their culture's version of beauty not the shit that has been whitewashed and put down on us as that standard um and that's why all that shit is is spilling over like yeah y'all niggas don't know how to do our shit because Nobody told y'all that our shit was worth doing. But guess what? It is. And if it wasn't, half of y'all wouldn't be out here trying to learn how to lay wigs. Because that's us. Y'all wouldn't be out here trying to learn how to do these long ass nails. That's us. You know what I'm saying? Like, the same way y'all want to have these this batty aesthetic. Then guess what? Y'all need to learn how to do that on us as well if you're gonna capitalize and you're going to um claim that and see that's the thing if you're gonna claim that you're not appropriating our shit 
because I think you are. If you don't know how, if you're, if you are trying to tap into that whole vibe and aesthetic and you can't turn around and sit a black girl down who doesn't have a stitch of anything on and turn her into a baddie, you're appropriating. Period. Because how in the hell you gonna know how to do that shit on you and you ain't the originator? That's, that's dumb as hell. Like, that's dumb as hell. It don't make no sense. <laughs> so for me, I think really that would probably be like mm. up there with you know making sure your kit is fully stocked and clean mm. and hygienic like one and two like they mm. actually are the same level of importance um when it comes to try at least trying to make money off the shit if you ain't trying to do you know if you're trying to just do this shit on your personal time and you want to like whatever like you're free to do that that's your business but i'm speaking to the people who are considering or heart who have already started taking that particular skill set and is now offering it as a service on a professional level yeah no and th thank you so much for sharing that i love that and i love especially the last part of that just bringing things full circle and it's like and i love how you ended on service oh yeah that's what it's all about. It, it's and I love how you mentioned and I'm tying all these strings together because that's how my brain works. <laughs> I'm tying how you mentioned do this shit for free at first, right? And now it comes back to the service part. And I feel like they're like on two sides of the spectrum, but they're disconnected. Somewhere along the line, they're disconnected. And then that ties into how we treat each other. Mm -hmm. That ties into how the producers don't have a goddamn kid. That ties into how have you have these non-black people, right? Not knowing how to do black makeup, right? Or these cultures, you know, doing not being able to do how other people's cultures. Mm -hmm. It's it's the service aspect. It's the people. Yeah. People are only looking in for themselves. It's, it's 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 it all goes back to like what is your bigger picture? Too many people like like you're finding your bigger picture. Yep. Body love, yep. advocate. I'm finding my bigger picture. Yep. Um, mission statement. You know, impact. You feel me? Trans, self transcendent, self actual. Like, w until you get to these bigger points, it's blinders on. They don't even see, like the the, the producers who are like, it's it, it's not even that they're like actively like thinking like, oh, it's it's just like they don't even see, you know. And it's until they transcend that self that whatever that oh, it's all about me or it's all about the project or like whatever incentives they have, until that incentive is bigger than them, they will. The, like telling them to, to to do it or telling them to change or marketing all this marketing or all this I, I'm not gonna call it bullshit because like you know if there, people are trying whatever people are trying I won't knock the effort right, of course. you know but I'm not gonna lie the, the, we gotta go to the source and the source is a lack of empathy that's really what it, it's a, it's a lack of a sense of that we are all connected and it's it's not about you it's about all of us because at the end of the day we all on this fucking planet. We got to find a way to fuck it. Also, too, I mean, if you think about it, life imitates what? Or art imitates mm. what? Life? Yeah. Art. I've never known which one. It's is. called art. I yeah, they say you know. they say art imitates life. Because mm. art is what's created. And so, yes, it's an imitation of mm. what the experience is of the artist, which is their life. So, if you think about that, it makes sense that there's a lack of, of uh, desire and a lack of inclusion because in this country specifically life for us is very out of the fringe like we are not included in nothing that happens in this motherfucker the only thing that we get included in is the performative shit you know what i'm saying so it makes total sense and that also speaking of strings that also ties into why you know, I do have the longevity that I have because uh, on the days that I didn't want to do my job anymore, I just kept thinking about the fact that there aren't enough people that are doing my job. And I'm like, OK, I'm going to get up and do this another day because I'm I'd rather I'd rather have a bad day and continue to do it than to just walk the fuck away from it completely and then continue to see the disaster <laughs> that is of 
artists that are claiming that you know oh i know how to do everyone and then you got folks out here you know feeling like they want to crawl and hide because they couldn't stand how they look when they got out the chair you know so um also too i just know that in some way shape or form no matter what whether the calling was one that i answered or if it was you know a calling that i sent the voicemail a couple of times <laughs> this was a calling as well you feel me this also was a calling and the makeup segued into my awareness of being mindful of all the people around me because my desire for inclusivity is stemmed from that makeup artistry uh experience you know what i'm saying like watching people not get foundation that match their skin tone being a person who when i used to work at certain makeup counters when they would give away samples they would always say oh well, cj we don't have your shade but we have a lipstick like i have nine thousand lipsticks i want to blush what the fuck i want a, a eyeshadow i want something that's gonna look like good on me you know what i'm saying y'all keep giving me these damn lipsticks like that's the only fucking thing that i can show is my lips like what type of weird shit are y'all on like some sambo type shit mm -hmm. you know so um if it hadn't been for seeing that shit with my own two eyes experiencing that both on the personal side and the professional side and watching it actually be a system a thing this wasn't just like a one fluke like oh i'm the only person going through this shit no my like my story is not not uncommon at all there's a whole genre of you know documentaries youtube television you know whatever all that stuff having these same conversations that i'm having with you right now so i think had it not been for me experiencing that you know it wouldn't have probably been as long for me to stay in this industry because i mean yeah the other stuff that i touched on was part of my motivation but once that shifted because all of those feelings were only temporary um once those feelings began to shift and i started to realize like okay no i'm not just doing this to prove anything to anyone because that point of my life is done i'm doing this now because there's a purpose behind it that's what became the purpose the purpose was y'all motherfuckers need to wake up and realize that like this systemic racist shit has racism shit has penetrated every fabric of life every fabric entertainment uh serious shit political shit religious all the things everything systemic racism has penetrated like with all the t's <laughs> penetrated <laughs> okay seriously because if something as fucking um disposable as a cosmetic product has sparked conversations of well why why don't y'all have more things for people that don't look white in y'all stores? Like, makeup is supposed to be fun. Makeup is supposed to be just like the same feelings of how, you know, y'all feel, masculine figures feel when y'all go get your hair cut, when you get your beard lined up, all that shit. All the, all the things that we do to make ourselves feel good. That's what cosmetics do for us as well. You know what I'm saying? And so... An arena that's supposed to go in and be a bomb ass experience, and you're supposed to walk out feeling like, mm, like, yes, you know, got you walking in and feeling like, wow, I shouldn't even fucking came in here because this is that bullshit. And then magnify it to, we already have, you know, that whole air of we can't walk in certain stores without motherfuckers feeling like we, you know, up to something. Steal some shit. Yeah, whether we are or, or or we're gonna have an attitude because unfortunately it's not just the whole thing about stealing. I've seen, heard, had to check as a manager people who have made very, very, very messed up assumptions about a client walking in because they see what they look like what they're dressed like and assume that they gonna have an attitude problem or assume that they just are asking a bunch of questions but won't buy shit because they probably don't have it to buy yeah yeah so my my journey in this shit it it has 
man, when I say that my purpose behind all of this shit has transformed on so many levels and morphed into so many different, you know, things. And now it, it's gone from, you know, makeup was my identity to now like makeup is a hyphen. I know that it's all definitely like, like I said, a calling that I probably just sent a voicemail, you know, like, <laughs> and was like, why do you keep calling me? <laughs> and they was like, we want to talk to you about your cards extended warranty. Boo boo. Come on. Mm-hmm. Here for this call. So <laughs> it, it's, it's definitely all it ties. It definitely ties. It ties in how, um, things kind of tied into becoming the body love advocate that I've become uh simply put I have more time after you know things shut down with the studio um I went through a bout of uh financial insecurity I'm still technically going through that right now because to be perfectly candid I am still in between trying to like decide whether or not I'm going to go after a salary position versus continuing to freelance freelance is freelancing is very unstable and I'm feeling the effects of that you know so I mean the hustle is always there but you got other factors that play into that so um with the time that I had on my hands though I decided that one I was tired of being in a state of depression in which everything that I was doing wasn't working my therapist was not my therapist sessions were steady and they were helping me with just like dumping and getting shit out but I wasn't feeling like I was receiving solutions that were helping me get out of that space you know and then on top of that I use the whole concept of putting myself together as my level of like coping you know I rather I rather put myself together and say well you know what you might have a shitty week but this outfit is fire the face valid like exactly and no it you know what i'm saying it isn't a permanent fix but it fixes for the day you know what i'm saying and so that turned into i'm gonna take a picture because i'm cute you know and then i'm gonna post it and then i might tag you know and the next thing you know folks are like Oh my goodness, I love the fact that you're, you know, wearing these outfits and you're showing off your curves. And I love the fact that, like, you don't give a fuck about not wearing heels and shit. Because I'm like, yeah, fuck y'all. I'm, I done had two kids swimming up in my body. You think I'm worried about a six-inch heel? Fuck y'all. You know, like, having that kind of just unapologetic nature mm-hmm. about the way that I'm now moving and navigating through life mm-hmm. is why I have become part, you know what I'm saying, of this mm-hmm. whole thing of, like, the body love part in that I, I do stress body love because at the end of the day I don't call it body positivity because first of all we ain't gonna segue but body positivity is definitely whitewashed and very, that's a whole other camera about to die hello so, right <laughs> but um I say body love because it's important to love every stage that it's in and love your body even on the days where you're not kind to it because on days certain days I'm not kind to my body and that doesn't mean kind as far as like what I'm eating and things like that I'm talking about if I'm overworking if I'm trying to push through being sleepy you know I got a time where oh maybe I need to sit down but I'm just like nah I gotta just I got things to do you know so that's what I mean when I say body love loving loving the transformation because yeah people some people start out their life slim and end up thickening up some people get thick and end up slim like You never know. Body love, if you're trans, you know, if you're a trans person and you're transitioning, body love through your stages. Body love through whatever. Because at the end of the day, the body that you have, that's it. You only get in your one shot. Whatever happens to it is what's going to happen to it. Whether it's something that happens naturally, genetics, whatever, or a, you know, accident, natural disaster, whatever. You just got to love that shit. You know, and that's not easy. Love for loving on your body looks different for everybody as well. Um, and so, yeah, I just started documenting that process. Now, you know, I'm back dancing. Um, I saw that. Yes. I'm stalking your, your gram. You thank you. Thank you. You know what I'm yes. saying? Drop a little. Shout out, Body Confidence for Queens. I love y'all, Mocha. Um, Shout out. 
Uh, but yeah, no, I'm I'm back physically moving my body again. I've yeah, separated. I'm call you always working out. Say get back from the gym. And it and it really is a stress reliever because I'm a mother of two and I'm a single mother and they get on my fucking nerves as much <laughs> as I love them. You know what I'm saying? So instead of me hollering and hooping, I'm going to the gym sweating and twerking. You know and coming home and saying, all right, you know what, mommy's too tired to yell. <laughs> Let's just take a bath, go to bed, call it a night. You know what I mean? So it's, and I'm loving my body through that. I'm loving, loving the fact that, you know, here I am on just shy of my 37th, I'll be honest, <laughs> birthday. And, you know, I'm feeling more physically fit than how I felt before I had my kids, wow. you know? And that's a new experience for me. And it has absolutely nothing to do with anything that is fat phobic or number or scale driven. And I'm proud of that. And I have now developed a new love for that part of, you know what I'm saying, this Mm -hmm. journey. So, yeah, body love, that just basically means in general, wherever you are in your in your process, embrace it, be happy, own it. If you're not happy, that's okay as well. As long as you're not hating or loathing or dwelling on the things that have absolutely nothing to do with you and your form. Because that's some shit that was projected on you, period. You know what I'm saying? Like, all of the hangups that we have about our bodies have nothing to do with what our bodies are naturally designed to do. And everything to do with the perception that a motherfucker who don't live in your skin has to say. And that makes no sense to me. You got a problem with me because my stomach hangs over my legs. Nigga, are you dumb? This, like, it's your body. You're not walking around with my belly. <laughs> Why are you mad? <laughs> like, it's this shit's stupid. It's yeah. A it's it, it really is. And it's also just a it's a sad reality that white supremacy european said european standards of beauty and racist as health quote-unquote practices have become so penetrated in this country that that anything that goes against that is seen as problematic that's really fucked up and the people who get the hardest hit with that are fat black women period yeah, and then that's that's a whole that's a whole thing like just getting into that. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate you for for talking about that and and yeah, like my my motto is like we are all spiritual beings having a human experience. Period. And everybody's period. experience is unique to themselves. Yes. But at the same time I like the unity aspect is that all of our lives just like a tree in the soil you know, it's connected by the roots, right? You got the nutrients, the nitrogen, and then the shoots, the roots shoot out. And, you know, so it's like when there's that network, but in the day, it's a fucking tree. So the tree is all of us, but then we do have those little shoot off in the network. But the thing is, one plus one is not two. One plus one is three. So, so as long as we keep putting each other down, as long as we keep, you know, projecting our insecurities onto other people, right? Because what we say about ourselves has an effect on us, but also what we say about others mm-hmm. has an, that can manifest for them too. Oh yeah, just because we haven't healed. So I definitely, I we have to end it on this note because oh, the cameras please. are about to die, and no I want to capture your magnificence to the end no of this. Worries. I don't want it to go black on us, but it's um, I feel like that's a beautiful note of just. I, I'm glad that the stage of you know body love advocation yes. and purpose, and I'm glad that you've you know, and your journey has so much more greatness to go. And I'm glad that you've come to this point and you're doing great things and you're feeling good. And it's just refreshing even me just hearing it. And yeah, I'm super excited. And I thank Thank you so much for spending your precious spiritual Sunday. Because I know people like to chill on Sunday. Like we look to the stairs of the elevator. Let's relax coming here. You know what I'm saying? Let's let's keep keep it chill. And um, yeah, I appreciate you. But uh, before we end though, I do want to, you know, for the guests, for the listeners, you know, how can they reach you know your uh, cosmetology how can they reach you on social media everything you do yes so um i have two accounts for my um that are representing me um my influencer account and that's uh where you can find outfits and 
uh, me talking about body love and acceptance is C-J-C-E-E-J-A-Y-E dot Iman, I-M-A-N. And then if you want to follow me um, for my work-related uh, business, all makeup only, skincare only posts, it's at CEO dot C-E-E-J, so C-E-O, Siege. Um, and then if you would like to support the business, it is Umoja, U-M-O-J-A, the first principle of Kwanzaa. Unity. Dot studio. Yes, Umoja dot studio. So I have three accounts. If you click on one, you'll get the links to all three. Um, and yeah, you can find me, same name on all platforms, CJ dot Iman. Beautiful. <laughs> Listen, y'all run her shit up, you feel me? Uh, spam that. And um, yeah, any last things you want to share with the Treehouse? Um, first of all, again, I do really appreciate being uh, welcomed on. And it's an honor and a pleasure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, no, I just, the main thing I think is out of this whole conversation, um, if anyone could take away anything, is that, you know, there is nothing wrong with existing in more than one space at the same time. You know, we touched on a lot of deep shit, but we also touched on a lot of light shit. Um, and you can also be in that space and that's totally normal. It's fine. You are not losing your mind for having pockets of gratitude in the midst of bullshit or having pockets of bullshit in the midst of your winning season. So just take that shit with you and you will understand like that is what makes you even more human, you know. I love that. Yeah. Absolutely love that. Absolutely. Um, without further ado, we like to do our little <laughs> treehouse thing. It's, um, it's the motto of the treehouse. Okay. You feel me? Oh. <laughs> this chair too small. Um, stay hydrated. Right. Stay breathing in yes. a good ass oxygen. Okay, let's do it. And most importantly, most importantly, stay basic. Mm -hmm.